Good morning. I want to thank you for joining with us again today. It feels like spring, doesn't it? Beautiful. We're thankful for the weather. And we're glad to be together to open God's Word. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to be encouraged. We're in the book of Revelation. So uh, it's great as we walk through. There's a lot going on. Let's just do a quick summary as we look at the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, what we see here in this chapter, we're looking to look at it relationally. We see Jesus Christ, and we see in this chapter, He is the one who loves us. Jesus Christ, He loves us. Now, when we think about Revelation, we think about apocalypse, we think of judgment, we think of the wrath of God, um, we think of all these terrible things that are taking place, the seals and the judgments and the bowls and all these things. We don't often think of the word love, yet Revelation begins that way in verse 5. Jesus Christ, He's a faithful witness, He's the firstborn of the dead, He's the ruler of the kings on the earth, and He is the one who loves us. He's the one who loves you. It's so significant, so important. Everything that's unfolding, he is doing because one of the character qualities of his heart is that he loves us perfectly. The children of God. He's, he's bringing to fulfillment all the promises that he has ever laid before us, and they are being fulfilled. Why? Because he loves us. We see in chapter 2 and 3 as well as we look at Christ, he calls us, in that relationship, he calls us to be overcomers. Seven times he mentions that. He also mentions, as we look here at uh, chapters 4 and 5, what do we see? We see the 24 elders who I believe represent uh, Israel, the Gentiles, the redeemed, all who have come to Jesus Christ. What are, what, are, what are we doing? What are they doing? We're worshiping. Everyone there is worshiping God, the Father and Jesus Christ. The whole scene is one of worship. Worshiping one who loves us so much. Exhibiting love to the one who loved us so much. God's love. It defines him. It transforms us. You know, there's a lot going on right now with COVID. Uh, your life is affected. My life's been affected. Ministries are affected. Everything is affected. It affects our church. It affects your life and how you, how you walk. What I want to do is I want to take uh, three weeks and flow from this reality here, revelation, of God's absolute love in the midst of, of judgment and wrath and yet promise and of hope. I want us to look at this element of worship. I want us to look at the reality of a life-to-life -life relationship with, with Jesus Christ. For us as a church, it's an opportunity to look at who we are, what God desires for us to be in, in the context of this book of Revelation, in the context of the, of the book of the Word of God, what he wants us to be, what he wants you as a believer to be, how he wants us to function in a relationship. I want us to be looking at that these next three weeks, and then we're going to step back into chapter 6, and we're going to move forward as we look at all the things that are going to unfold. But first, and really significantly important, is reminding ourselves of our relationship and what that means. I want you to catch that. I need to catch that for my life. As a pastor, as I lead, we need to understand what this all means. God's love is, indeed, it's a life-to-life -life, life reality. It's a life-to-life -life relationship. I want this to be the mark of my ministry. I want this to be an emphasis that comes out of my ministry as a pastor, as a church. I want us to catch, I want us to understand, I want us to, to, to see the significance for you and I as individuals to have that life-to-life -life connection or relationship with Christ, and then the impact of that in our church, in our churches, in our community, and around us. We go clear back to Genesis and we're reminded that we are created to reflect, to bear the image of God. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Well, the greatest expression of who God is as image bearers is the love of God. We're going to see that. In Genesis, we see this. We're created. We're created to love and to be loved. The Lord said to, to Adam, about Adam, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. God created Adam with the ability to love his helper, Eve, a, a woman made just for him. And this helper would in turn reflect love back to him. He created us with a capability, with a need to love and to be loved. This is a love relationship is what this is all about. God created us expressly for that. Psalm chapter 95 reminds us of Revelation 4 and 5. Let us worship, let us bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker. We are created to worship. We are created to reflect that, not just in the past 
when he made Adam and Eve in the future in Revelation 4 and 5 and for all eternity. And that is the greatest expression of love is, is worship. We worship because we love. That's the key. Now as we, as we move forward today, I want us to, we're going to be reflecting on one dynamic of this relationship. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 reminds us sin came into play and man, man directed his love, Adam and Eve directed their love to something else, to someone else. The woman saw this tree. She took of its fruit, the tree. She gave it to Adam. They both ate. They had everything that they needed. It was perfect. It was whole. That's now what God does. He gives us everything that we need. We take our eyes off of him and we look elsewhere. That's what sin does to us. They were attracted to something else, to being something that was promised but would not be fulfilled. Satan made a promise he couldn't keep. They sinned because they loved something else more than God. I want us to look at that today. Our greatest need is revealed, it's expressed. The antithesis of that is, is God's perfect continuing love for us. He continued to love Adam and Eve, even though they fell into, into sin, even though they were disconnected and their relationship was broken because of sin. He continues to love us today. We're going to see that this, as well. God's love. This is all about God's love this morning. Ultimately, what does this mean in our life? What's the impact uh, on us? God's love, it brings mercy into our life. God is rich in mercy. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. We were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins. But what did he do? He loved us. He, he had mercy on us. He is provided. The greatest gift that God has ever given is his love. For God so loved the world. That's the greatest gift he's ever, ever given to us. And God has, God has given us a wealth of riches in Jesus Christ. The greatest gift was a love of God, expressed, made available to mankind. The greatest gift. We're going to talk about that this morning. His love, indeed, is the greatest gift because it saves us. He gave His only Son. You know, when we express faith in Him, when we believe in Him, He gives us the most precious thing that could ever be given, His life. But why? Because He loves us. Chapter 1, verse 5 of Revelation. That love, the result of that love, because He loved us, he frees us. He frees us from the bondage of our sins. That's what he does. God's love brings freedom. Don't you want freedom? I mean, don't you want freedom to experience that? Love is the key. That love relationship is the key for you and for me. So God's love becomes a, a life to life reality. It defines our relationship. God's love is to define your relationship, is to define the relationships within a church it is to define us. That's how important this is. That's why we're stopping back to look at this. Revelation 1.5. That quality of Christ affects everything else that happens in, in Revelation. It reflects the whole of Scripture. 1 John 4.8-9. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this is the love of God. It was made manifest among us. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. God's love brings life. It defines us. It, he gives us new life. In that love relationship, He defines everything that we will ever become and ever be. It is His love that makes that happen. Never doubt God's love for you this, ever. Never doubt that. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, never doubt that. His love reveals relationship, our relationship. John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. His love that he's poured out to us in relationship through Christ, that love is to define everything that we do. Every relationship is to be defined, impacted by that. It's to touch every relationship we ever have. Re Re Romans chapter 13, Paul writes these powerful words. He says we are obligated to express love to everyone we ever encounter. That's amazing. We have a debt, owe oh, no one anything except to love each other. The love of God is to be poured out in, into my heart so that it comes out of my life no matter who I encounter. I, folks, I can't do that unless God enables me. I can't do that unless I keep my eyes on Christ. I can't do that unless I view others and what's happening around me through his lens. But the powerful thing is we can do that in Christ. His love is that powerful. It can touch every relationship we have. 
In fact, it's the most important thing that we are called to do and to be. Ecclesiastes 12. Vanity is vanity. Life is worthless without God, but with God. This is how Solomon ends. We believe Solomon wrote this. He says, after he's tried everything in life, after he, after he wandered from the Lord in obedience and came back to him, he writes these words. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This brings us to the verses that are going to be the cornerstone today, tomorrow, next week, and for our church moving forward. It reflects the ministry that God would have us to do as a church. It reflects the, it reflects the heartbeat that God would have you to cherish and treasure more than anything else. These, this, is, this is what God's given to us here. Solomon reflects this. All of the Old Testament, all of the law, everything that's important, he says this is what's most important. Keep his commandments. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, we've been looking at it as a church a little bit. It's, it's in the New Testament, Luke chapter 10. Our greatest responsibility, our greatest response back to God is to love him. Because Jesus affirmed an answer that's given here. The greatest thing that we can do is to love you shall love. You shall love God. You shall love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. He calls us to that. For every believer, that's the highest calling we could ever have. That is, that is to be the essential focus of our life, of our walk, of everything that we do, is expressing the love of God back to Him and to others. We have a problem here. We have an issue that comes up. Sin, sin is the problem. Sin reveals that we have a broken relationship. Sin, because of sin, man's relationship with God is broken. Man is born in a sin condition. Man has no relationship with God because of that brokenness, because of that sin barrier. We need a Savior. We need Christ. And so what does sin do? The minute I'm born, I am born with a, a propensity. I'm born with, a, with, a, with an, an, an inner drive to find fulfillment in something and someone else other than God. I don't know how to love God because sin holds me in its grip. Sin holds me in bondage. I'm not able to love God because I don't have that relationship with God. Sin redirects what I love to something else and to someone other than God. Just like Adam and Eve. Their love was redirected because of their attraction to sin in that moment. And they fell. And they failed. Now Satan's constantly trying to convince us that life with, with God is, is not worth it. It's, it's giving up our personal freedom. It's giving up our identity. It's giving up our pleasures and the things that we want. God shows us something vastly different. But sin redirects us. Sin prevents us from loving God. That's the key. I want to go briefly to a passage of Scripture in Mark 4. It's the parable of the sower and the seed. You know this. I'm just going to take a quick look at it. Mark chapter 4, verse 15. And these are the ones, the seed. These, this seed was, was sown along the path where you walk and it's hard and it's packed. Okay, Sown along the path where the word is sown. And when they hear, the word is the word of God. And when they hear it, when the person responds, when they hear the word of God, Satan immediately comes. He takes away the word that is sown in them. What is revealed here is that is there is love in this verse, but there's not love for God. There's a love for myself. What happens? The word of God touches my heart, and immediately Satan comes along, and he, and he offers a counter message. He reminds me that I am the most important. I don't need God. He reminds me that this message is... is uh, debilitating in my life that this message will will hold me back and hold me down and, and this message it will stifle life and the gospel is is the enemy and satan comes along and he immediately works in your heart and mind when that gospel is at work for the first time and he, and he seeks to steal that away and how does he do that he brings the focus to me and to myself and to my life and the impact it will have on us and and so and so what happens is our love is distracted we view ourselves as greater than God. We view ourselves as what we want, what's important to us, the priorities of our life. We place that on a higher pedestal than what we see God offered and what we see who God is. We look at our life and we esteem ourselves. 
And Satan takes that seed away immediately. He takes the gospel away, and the gospel is seen and previewed, uh, understood as, as, as the enemy. And um, when we were seeking to reach people for Jesus Christ, that becomes the challenge. That becomes a challenge to us. We're, we're, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. We're building relationships. We're tilling soil. We're building bridges. We're always praying and asking God to do a work in the heart. God's got to touch the heart. One of the things that needs to be overcome is this, is speaking to the things that we love that in, in the end will fail, will be bankrupt, will not, be, will not fulfill its promises to us, and where God is the only one who can meet the condition of our heart, the condition of our life, and bring the fulfillment, the meaning, the purpose, the hope, the joy that we need. We love ourselves. And the Word of God doesn't have a chance in the moment, unless, of course, God is at work by the Spirit. Verse 16 and 17, and these are the ones, this seed is, is sown on the rocky ground. They're just rocks everywhere. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises, on account of the word, immediately they fall away. The reality here is this, is again, this individual loves, but not God. This individual, because of, because of that sin nature, the love of this heart has, has been directed to something else other than God. What we love here is the blessing. We love the blessing more than we love the giver. Everyone wants God to bless. This individual here seeks and wants the blessing of God. They receive the gospel because the gospel is perceived as, as uh, good news, as transformative, as as the best thing since apple pie. It's, it's, it'll make my life better. Boy, I need this in my life. Um, I believe this in my life. And I, I want this and I need this. But, when, but, when, but there's no relationship to the one who, who has given the blessing. The focus is on the blessing, is on the joy, is on the feelings, is on the emotions, is on all that, is on that immediate sense of my life is better. But you know, God has promised every believer that fiery trials, tribulation, challenges are going to be part of our life. When this happens, then immediately there is, there is disappointment in the gospel, in God. There's a falling away. And so what's revealed is a lack of relationship in Jesus Christ. There is a love here, but it is not for God. It is not for the giver. It's for, I want some good stuff. Sure, I want to know God. Sure, I think He's important. Sure, I think He's the answer, but but when it gets hard, that relationship is not there. In verse 18 and 19, and other seed is sown along the thorns, among the thorns. Those who hear the word, there's the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, those things all enter in. They choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Again, there is love here. These are people. These seeds represent people. There are relationships here. There's the ability to love. But see, sin taints our love. Sin prevents us from loving God. Only the Holy Spirit can, can touch the heart and break through that barrier. Until the Spirit of God does, sin will bring us to this place where we reject the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Here, there is a love, but it's a love for it's a love for uh, uh, living in the moment. It's a, it's a love for going for the gusto. It's it's a love for having all that I can have. The cares of this world are just the challenges of life. You know, I'll I'll make things happen. The cares of the world. I'll get it done. I'll pull up my bootstraps and I'll get it done. I can do it. It's it's the it's just riches. It's 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 going after and having as much as I possibly can. It's just seeing stuff. Other things in this world that I want, I want. I'm always looking, never content. I always want one more thing, one more dollar, right? And all those things come in and they just crowd out relationship. They crowd out yieldedness to Christ. They crowd out the need for a Savior. And there is love here. People who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior deeply love. 
But sin has broken our ability to love God, to love Jesus Christ, to see Him as the one that we need. And so that's important. This parable reminds us that it's a spiritual battle as we engage people for Jesus Christ. Even if we know Jesus Christ, even as believers, sin can taint our ability to love. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. The church here in Ephesus, I have this against you. You have abandoned your love. You have abandoned your first love. You don't love me like you did. And it's impacted everything that you do. It happens to us if we're not careful. And it will have a huge impact on your life and mine. What happens is we fail to love. We fail to love God biblically. We fail to love others biblically. And it has significant impact. Remember, our standard is this. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Our standard is we are to love God with, with everything. And we are to love with an agape love, with a biblical love, with a sacrificial love. We are to love others. We are to love God. That's the standard. That's what God calls us back to. That's why it's so important here. For the believer, sin taints our ability to love when it gets in the way. So what happens love becomes love becomes uh, performance based before god we 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 act we please god so that he'll love us we, we do what we do so that god will love us and you know what when we fail when we sin when we fall away when we disobey we doubt we doubt that god loves us the word of god makes it clear he loves us always eternally when we step into a relationship with him through jesus christ you know what we're going to mess up we're going to sin this week. None of us are perfect. But God wants you to have the confidence of your relationship in Jesus Christ. It is eternal. It is sound. It is, it is bound in Christ. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. When you are saved, He loves you with a love that will never grow stronger, never grow, grie- no, never grow weaker. It is perfect love for all time, for every moment. He loves you as much then as He will tomorrow. You need to know that and be encouraged by that. When we are performance-based love, we, we see obedience as gaining favor. I want to stay on God's good side. That's what I want to do. We, focused on, we focus on what we need to do, the act. We don't focus on the heart. We focus on doing, not becoming. We, we, set, we, we set up these standards around our life so that we feel good about ourselves and our relationship with God. They're artificial. Traditions and, and, and things that we put into our life so that, so that we so that we have a sense that we are right before God, but they're, they're in addition to the Word of God, and they're man-made, and, and so they come to be a problem in our life. We lose sight of relationship. We lose sight of grace. We lose sight of God's mercy, His power for living. Performance-based relationship then affects our ability to love God. It affects our ability to love others as well. It's the reality. We, we give a false sense of what spirituality is all about. We put, this, we put this mask on when we're around other believers, this veneer around us, and, and we think we're okay, and we communicate that to others. We're not able to be uh, honest with others. We're not able to be honest with them. I left the tea up, didn't they? <laughs> we're not able to be honest with people, to be real with people, to be genuine with people, because we're afraid they're going to see us for who we are. I'm that way with people because I'm that way with God. We impose standards, unachievable standards on people uh, for godliness, for, for approval. If I'm going to approve you, you have to do Christianity my way. See, love's been tainted when we, when we are that way with other people. We, uh, we quickly are disappointed with others. You find yourself that way with others? Just so quick, so quick to be disappointed with them over things that they do. And they don't meet our standards. They don't do it our way. We just live in that mode. We lack grace. We lack genuine love. Performance. This is all about performance. We teach. We exhibit. We model. Ultimately, a, a, a faith that is of works and not relationship. This is important. These are one of the ways that, that sin affects the believer and his, and his and her ability, your ability, my ability to love when these things get in the way. The poster child for this is Saul, right? Before he knew Jesus Christ, he says, I got confidence. I got more confidence than anybody. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law. I was blameless. You know, if he was living in our church today, 
he would present himself to everyone in that church. I am the man. I have arrived. If you're going to live, you've got to be like me. If you're going to be spiritual, you're going to have a relationship with God, you've got to have these things in your life. Now we know, we know God touched his heart, changed his life. Saul became Paul. He became humble. He, said, I, he, says, he says, I count all these things. So all these things on this page right here in these verses is a loss. If it means knowing Jesus Christ. Another way that love is tainted is it becomes self-centered. Before God, we lose our first love. Ephesians, we saw that. The church in Ephesus. We live, we live on the horizontal plane. That we lose that vertical element. We, lo we lose that relational element. That's what takes place. We love God. God's in our life if He's convenient. See, that's what happens. It becomes self-centered. Life becomes about me. And God, God has moved to the periphery. That's what takes place. We love God if He makes me happy. If, he, if I'm fulfilled in that. If life gets difficult or if life gets hard, if, if he touches my life and, he, and, he's, and he's moving by the Spirit of God to change me, I don't like that. Because I'm thinking about myself. And when I'm thinking about myself, I don't want to change. I don't want to be like God. We follow our own heart. We follow our own path. We follow our own destiny. We create our own destiny. We, we seek to do this. When the believer's in this mode, it's nothing but trouble in our life. So we're no longer seeking God's heart. We're not seeking His will. Uh, so that we can hear His voice, know Him, obey Him, follow after Him. That's the problem. It affects our relationship with other people around us as well. We don't love others. You know what? The unbeliever and the, and the believer who is not walking with the Lord, they are capable of absolute love of people, but not a biblical love, not an agape love, an emotional love, a feeling-based love, a love where they treasure others, but it's not that biblical love that we talk about here. We live for now, but not for eternity. We're living on that plane right now. Uh, we don't value others when, when they seek to stretch us, to move us towards Christ. We don't value that. We don't want that. We don't want that influence in my life. We, we, we hold them out here like this because sin is tainting our ability to love God. We don't let others get close. If, if I'm self-centered in my love, I'm not going to let people get close to my life and see into my life and speak into my life and pray over my life and love me, we won't do that. Often what happens is we leave behind a, a string of damaged relationships because I'm living for me. It affects everything I do. It affects every relationship that I have. In the end, people get hurt. You know, we all get hurt. We've all been hurt. Even when we try to, to love and to be what God would have us to be, we all get hurt. But I tell you what, when we're living for ourselves, when you're living for yourself, this just becomes the pattern of life. There's just damage that is strewn behind us. We use people rather than love people. All of this is the opposite of God's love in our life. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love does not insist on its own way. You know, when I do this, when I'm in this place, and I get there, when I'm in this place, then I am not loving biblically. And it affects me and the people around me. It affects you and the people around you. Your love is tainted by sin. My love is tainted by sin. James 3.16 where selfish and je jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be, it's a promise, there will be disorder in every vile practice. When I'm self-centered, when, when my relationship is about me and not about God, people around me will get hurt. Disorder will come out of my life. Chaos will come out of my life. People will be hurt. You will be hurt and the people around you will be hurt. Yeah. The third, the third way in which love gets tainted for the believer when we're not walking with the Lord is, it, is we become people pleasers. We don't love God. We don't love Him first. We don't love Him foremost. We put people ahead of God. We view God on the performance level, which we talked about. That's what we do. We fail to exhibit God's power, His transforming power. Because I'm into because I'm into what people think. It's not about it's not about God and what He wants in my life. It's not about His power at work in my life. It's about what others think and about what I think about my life. We like so we like power. We like the power of new life in Jesus Christ. The gospel. You know, when the gospel touched our life, it changed us. That power is to be transformative in our life, moving forward all the time. And so here's the thing: we're we're unable to truly impact the people that we love the very most for Christ. That's, that's powerful. That's powerful. You know, before other people, there's impact. Performance love becomes people-pleasing love because it's all about performance and being seen 
then I'm all about pleasing people. We put people before God. We put people before obedience. We put people before faithfulness. We put friendships. We put feelings over our speaking truth into our into their life. God would have us to have to invest into people's life for the sake of Christ, and that and that is is nullified when I'm living for myself and I'm and it's all about pleasing the people in my life. I won't risk living for Christ if it's going to hurt my relationships. And so we make people the focus of our life. We live for people. And so we view God in this way. God infringes on my relational freedom. He infringes on my ability to interact with who I want to interact with, who I want to be, what kind of person I want to be. And that's what happens when, when our love for Jesus Christ gets tainted. It nullifies my service for Jesus Christ. Paul says, am I seeking the approval of man or of God? That's a good question. If I were trying to please man, Paul says it very clearly, I would not then be a servant of Jesus Christ. When I wake up every day, I have a choice to make. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, uh, 24. We, you can't serve two masters at the same time. Either you're going to hate and despise one, or you're going to love and to be devoted to one. You can't serve God, and the context here is money. You can't serve God in something else. You can't serve God in someone else. I have to choose every day. Who is it I'm going to follow after? Remember, right here? I, I can't, I can't, my master can't be pleasing others and pleasing God. I can't choose two. If I'm going to be a servant of Jesus Christ, truly serve him, then everything else in my life has to be yielded to that. I have to make a choice every day. First Corinthians remind us that if I don't love, if I if I can do all kind of things that religion offers, that God even calls me to do, if I can do all those things, if I can express all the things that God would have me to do, but I don't, I'm not defined by the love of Jesus Christ. He reminds me here I'm nothing. I, I've accomplished nothing of value. In fact, what I've done is I've alienated people from Christ because I've not shown them the love of Jesus Christ. In our church, in our life, for us, it needs to be life to life with Christ, with others. It's so significant. Let's go back to this verse, 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love, that's biblically, agape, sacrificial, who does not love the way God would have us to love, does not know God because God is love. When God saves an individual, God puts the imprint of love on their heart and he calls us to then exhibit, to model, to be people who, who are willing to love others as Christ loved us. You know, to Peter, Peter said to, God said to Peter, he asked him this question, do you love me more than these? They're, they're, they've just uh, finished eating fish. They were out catching fish, couldn't find anything. Jesus told them to throw down the net. They caught an amazing, miraculous size, brought it in. They had fish together. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love these more than me? Now, the word these is not identified uh, specifically in that text. Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than the income that these fish bring? Do you love me more than the satisfaction this fish brings? Do you love me more than these fish? Or it could be, Peter, do you love me more than these men right here, these other disciples? Do you love me more than the relationships you have here that you treasure and are, are now important after three years? Peter, do you love me more than these things? That's the question he asks. And then he says to Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Love, biblical love, is the essential cornerstone of your life before Jesus Christ. It's the essential cornerstone of Emmanuel Baptist Church and all the churches around here who are authentic in Jesus Christ. If we don't know how to love people, we will lose the power of our testimony. If we don't know how to love Christ first, we will lose the power of our testimony. This is so important. Our life to His, our life to others, it's contingent upon relationship. That's what we're seeing here from Revelation as a springboard into, into this reality. It is life to life. The love of God must define us in everything that we do. Next week, we're going we're to talk about life-to-life -life living. The reality is this. 
when I am in a life-to-life -life relationship with Jesus Christ, it reveals genuine relationship. Okay? It reveals a genuine relationship. That's key. I want, I, want, I want you to come back next week. I want us to engage on this together. I want the Spirit of God to, to touch your heart with this reality and challenge us. Luke chapter 10 reminds us it is a genuine relationship that God is calling us to. Into and then to reflect. It's, it's a genuine relationship. If Jesus Christ is my Savior, I will reflect this. It will be reflected first before anyone else ever sees it. It will be reflected in my heart. Jesus will touch your heart, and he will change you, and he'll do it every day. Because he's doing that, it's going to ooze out of your life. It's going to come out of your life. When adversity comes, when adversity is poured into your life, what's going to come out, what's going to show, what's going to be revealed is a love for God, a trust for God, a love for others. The love of God and its foundation is going to come out of my life. This is key. I want you to memorize these verses right here. I want you to commit them to memory, to your heart. We're going to be using them over and over again in the, in the time to come. Not even just the next three weeks, but far beyond that. It's a genuine relationship. It is to be expressed. 2 Corinthians 5.20 We're ambassadors for Christ. We're to be reconciled to God. We're to be right with God. That's relationship. God's called all of us to reflect that relationship. We are to express it. We express it when it first has changed us, when it's first touched our heart, when it's when God is beginning to do a powerful, miraculous work in my life, it is seen by other people. It is power. It's power for living. Second Peter 1 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. That's relationship. This morning we focused, we focused just on this, the biblical reality that God loves you. When He saved you, He called you into a love relationship. The gospel is about God's love to you and for you. It is about God's pouring His love into your life and to mine. Because He has filled us with His love, because we are genuine, authentic believers of Jesus Christ, it will come out of our life. It will be expressed as we grow, as we're molded to the character and the image of Jesus Christ, the love of God will come out. If sin is in our life, that love will be tainted. Our ability to express that love will be tainted. Where are you, where are you at in this expression? Where are you at? Peter, do you love me more than these other things? If Jesus were to ask you that question, blank, do you love me more than all these other things in your life? Do you love me more than these? If that's true, then that vertical relationship is going to be growing. That vertical relationship is going to be taking place. And the horizontal elements will be affected. And, and Christ will be invested into the people around you by your example in your life. It's powerful living. I want to invite you to come back next week. We're going to step back into Revelation, but we need this right now. It reflects the reality of chapter 1, verse 5. That Jesus Christ loves us. It reflects the reality of chapters 4 and 5. That we are to be worshipers. Why do we worship God? Why are we obedient to God? Why do we do what He would have us to do? We do that because we love Him. We're going to talk about that relationship next week. It is significantly important to you and to me. Let us join together. Let us commit our hearts to growing, to, to hearing what God would have us to hear. May it shape, may it mold how we do ministry as a church. There are, there are things here in Emmanuel that need to change and are changing. It's pretty exciting, quite frankly. I love what God's doing here at Emmanuel. And my prayer is that God will continue to do a work that enables us to express, to model, to display the love of God, not not only within the community of believers here, but through this community of believers, out into all of our relationships into the people around us. May the Lord bless that. With power may He speak into your life and mine. Thanks for joining with us. We'll see you next week. Be blessed. Keep walking with the Lord with strength. Grow in Him this week and memorize Luke chapter 10 verse 27. We'll see you next week. Lord bless.